the name of the one holy and undivided Trinity. Amen. Please be seated. On the night Barack Obama was elected, Aaron and I were sitting in a small neighborhood Italian restaurant in Morningside Heights, the neighborhood of our seminary in Upper Manhattan, with our former bishop, Nettie Rivera, and another seminarian and his wife. He went to general, and we were dutifully having our check-in with the bishop while she was in town. But we were also fidgeting a little bit wondering how the results were going, and this is before cell phones were all small computers we carried in our pockets. So we had to keep tugging at a waiter every few minutes to ask which states had been called and for whom. Finally, it did seem that he was going to win, and, uh, and dinner, we finally said enough things about how our life was going to our bishop, uh, and we were released back into the world. Um, and we headed out to 125th Street in Harlem, where the Apollo Theater is. And we knew there would be a live broadcast, whatever was happening that night. And when we got to the edge of that street, we almost couldn't believe what we were seeing. The street was packed with people. There's no way a car could have fit through there. Grandmothers were screaming out of third floor windows. There was confetti. Young men were drumming and children were crying and strangers were hugging and people were, you know, hooked like monkeys over the phone booths, high-fiving anybody who went by. And to be in the center of America's first black cultural center on the night of the election of the first black president was an experience of like ecstatic contact high. I had just never felt something like that coming off of people's bodies outside of charismatic or Pentecostal worship. And we stayed out to watch him and his family walk out onto that stage on the jumbotron. And afterward, this group of us from our seminary who had gone out, we all made our way back to our seminary. And they had opened one room for prayer. And we spent several hours, a good portion of that night, praying for the Obama family mostly that they be protected from assassination. And the mood in that room was very quiet. It was not jubilant. It was scared. Most of the people who had come to pray were black, people who knew intimately the kind of danger he and his family were in. Now, I'm not saying that I was in favor of many of Obama's policies, and I don't worship presidents because I have a savior. And I don't expect, I don't tell you this story expecting that everyone in this room shared an experience of joy on that night. In fact, I hope not, that we have a little more wiggle room than that. I share this experience simply to communicate what it looked like in our contemporary life for there to be an experience of a community used to looking at power from below, getting a taste of power from above. Today we hear the story of Jesus entering Jerusalem at the beginning of the week of the Passover celebrations. And according to Marcus Borg, Jerusalem was a pretty complex symbol and city at this time. On the one hand, the temple was there, the center of their religious life and offering. Um, the, uh, I, the dean of the cathedral in Sacramento who spoke to the um, campus ministry groups last weekend was like, it was like having the Supreme Court and the White House. 
and um, the National Cathedral all in one building. On the other hand, it was also the place where a few elite religious leaders had chosen to collaborate with Rome, acquiring relative positions of status, wealth, and power within that occupying government. And on what we now call Palm Sunday, Jesus enters Jerusalem from the east in a procession riding on a donkey. On the same day, Pontius Pilate was leading his annual imperial procession of troops and cavalry from the West. Borg writes, their purpose was to reinforce the Roman garrison stationed near the temple for the season of Passover, when tens of thousands of Jewish pilgrims fill the city, and not insignificantly, they were there to celebrate escape from an autocratic ruler who had owned them and their labor. So a good politician had a right to be nervous on that holiday. But this entry point into Jerusalem, this procession that Jesus is leading, is not an accident. It would be a little bit like if someone in Seattle decided to accidentally stage a protest on election day. You're like, oh yeah, that's not, you can't claim that's a coincidence, right? It's a pretty prominent day in our public life. Um, it doesn't just happen that way. So we have the situation where there's two processions headed for Jerusalem on the same day. We have Jesus on his colt. Cheering him on are all the peasants, the hicks who have all attached themselves to this no-good healer out of Nazareth, whereof nothing good can come. He isn't very cosmopolitan, though he seems to be pretty smart. Um, he has a cheap ride, and his fans are waving tacky tree branches, whatever they happen to find. And so there's a deep contrast that will inevitably lead to a clash. And on the one side is the government, there's wealth, urbanity, pilot, power, the judicial system, armed men, occupiers, citizens. On the other side is Jesus, with rural people and uneducated people, men, women, children, people who are a third gender of that time called eunuch, that isn't man or woman, but that Jesus said would be given a name above all others, and non-citizens. According to the prophet Zechariah, the king entering Jerusalem on a donkey, what that king was there to do was to banish weapons of war from the land and establish peace among the nations. And all these people are there to witness what Zechariah had promised about that. In a week when we're holding Syria and Stockholm and Cairo, we know what this feels like. The people with Jesus, too, are in a frenzy. They are so happy. They're so happy that something big might finally happen, that they finally see someone like them, a healer, someone who loves them, go to take on this massive, uh, this massive apparatus. Some of them, though this portion is often overblown in how we talk about it, are hoping and expecting Jesus to be able to raise enough troops to engage a military-on-military -military fight. Most people have looked around and know better, however. That does raise the question for us, though. If they know better and they know that what's going to happen is not army on army, what are they expecting of Jesus as they wave their branches as he slow rides into town on the opposite side of Pilate. What are they hoping for? What do they think he's going to do? 
What do we expect Jesus to do when we wave our own branches? There's power in a crowd, power that can be used for good or for ill. There's a fine line between a crowd and a mob. And it is human nature to want someone else to fix it to fix our worry or our anxiety, our frustration, our fear, our money, our bodies, our powerlessness. Fix it, Jesus, is still a prayer on many lips today. And it may even be something we bring to church on Sundays with worries and aches we simply don't know what else to do with. There is a little note of caution, however. When we pin our hopes on one man, as we still do today, it can mean we take responsibility off our own shoulders. And we make hurting us easy for our enemies. Because they know that if they kill that one man, We all go down. And we get thrown into confusion and chaos because he was supposed to do it. He was supposed to change it and fix it. Strike the shepherd and the flock scatters. And we continue to do this even when those men have spent their short lifetimes telling us that it takes all of us to be leaders in our own lives, to work to heal our own communities, to step up for one another, to welcome the smallest and most vulnerable among us, even when one of them tells us repeatedly to not tell anyone he's the Messiah because he knows that will create a frenzy centered on him instead of the kingdom of heaven he keeps relentlessly preaching takes all of us. Even when one of them tells us again and again and again that the kingdom of heaven is among us, among us, among us, because when it is divided that way among all disciples, it cannot be killed, we don't listen. Today we are delighted that Jesus has made it this far, that he's showing publicly in this procession that the kingdom of God has nothing to fear from the kingdom of men. We cheer him on hoping everything will change. We hope they will do it. We don't know how. We want to yell and wave and then forget about it on the way home. Sometimes we don't want to know how because it might mean we all have to do it. 